research on the Robinson County Tennessee Plantation called Wessington. And I've traced all the lives of all the families of all the slaves uh, there over a 30 year period plus. All of this started when I was in the seventh grade and we used a social studies textbook called Your Tennessee. And for some reason I seemed drawn to this photograph, but at the time I had no idea that I was actually looking at my own great great grandfather and mother. Shortly after I got out of uh, school for summer vacation, it was the plantation's 150th anniversary. So our local newspaper, the Robertson County Times, did a feature article on the plantation owners and had uh, their photographs and had a photograph of the slaves there. The gentleman seated was Emmanuel Washington, and he was the cook on the plantation. Seated beside him was Henny Washington. She was the head laundress. Standing left was Alan Washington, and standing right was Randall Washington. My uh, maternal grandmother, Sarah Washington, happened to be visiting us from Chicago at the time, and she spent the weekend with one of her older brothers. And at the conclusion of her visit, she asked my grandmother, to, uh, she asked my mother to have me to bring a camera when we came to pick her up. And I asked my mother, I said, why does uh, grandma want me to bring a camera after our brother's house? And she said, just do like she said, you'll find out. <laughs> so I complied with that. And so when my grandmother showed me the article, I said, grandmother, that photograph is in our history book. Who is that? And she told me that the gentleman seated was her grandfather, Emmanuel Washington, and he had been a cook on the Washington plantation. And that's how their family got the Washington surname. So I was totally excited, couldn't wait to get back to school to tell my classmates that my great great grandfather and mother's photograph was in our history book. Some of them believe me, some of them didn't. So my great uncle told me that the white Washington family that owned Westington still lived in the mansion. And if I would call them and tell them who I was, they would have records. Uh, the buildings on the plantation, most of them were still intact at the time. So the very next morning, I called and spoke to Ann Consolidate Cabot, and she was a sixth generation descendant of Joseph Washington, who founded Westington Plantation in 1796. Uh, when I called and told her who I was, she said, well, everyone knows who your great-great-grandfather was because we still have his portrait in our living room. So at that time, she ran a local bookstore uh, that was within walking distance of my home, so I went to meet her, and she brought this portrait of my great-great-grandfather. He was born in Derrick, Wilson, April 23, 1824, and he died there in 1907. The Washington family commissioned a famous artist, Maria Howard Wheaton, to paint his portrait, and it's still in the possession of the direct descendants of the Washington family, and it's estimated to be valued at around $25,000 today. She also brought out um, about 10 legal sized documents which recorded the births of the slaves on the plantation from 1795 to 1860. And I was able to find my great great grandfather's exact date of birth as well as some of my earlier ancestors. When I was a very small child, five or six years old, my uh, maternal grandfather would often take me for a ride in the country when I got out of church. So often he would stop at the entrance gate to Westington and he would point and tell me that my grandmother's family came from there, which I knew my grandmother's family were Washington, even when I was that small, but I had no idea what he really meant. So uh, Mrs. Talbot invited me out to Westington, and as soon as my mother brought me there, and I came to the entrance gate at all dawn, only then what my grandfather was really trying to tell me, that my family's history went back some 200 years to Westington. This is the Westington Mansion, and it was started in 1815 and completed in 1819, entirely by slave labor, it's on the National Register of Historic Homes. Historic Homes. <clears throat> uh, visiting Westington for the first time was like going back in history, in a way, because most of the buildings were still intact, all the furniture was still in the house, dated from the 1700s, especially up to the Civil War period. There were portraits of some of the other slaves. There were furnishings that had been passed down in some of the slave families as well. There were also a number of slave cabins still standing at that time. In 1860, there were 40 log cabins on Westington Plantation, which housed 274 enslaved African Americans, which was the largest in the state of Tennessee at that time. Mr. Talbot also took me to the slave cemetery in Westington, where my great-great-grandfather and mother are buried, as well as some of our earlier ancestors. She also told me that in 1964, the Washington family deposited all their plantation records correspondence in the Tennessee State Library and Archives in Nashville. It's on 69 rolls of microfilm, it's over 11,000 documents, which I found through these documents many, many times, uh, in addition to tracing my own ancestry, all the other families that came from Westington. There are many letters in that collection. Uh, George A. Washington was the second owner of Westington, and uh, when his father was an older man, 
uh, they turned over the management of the plantation to him. So he would travel to New Orleans to sell their tobacco. He would go to Virginia and Maryland to purchase slaves. He would go to New York to make investments. So while he was away, his mother and his father, the plantation overseer, and uh, his wife would write letters what's going on on the plantation, which slaves ran away, who had a baby. There's even one letter uh, detailing when the Cherokees were on the Cherokee uh, removal, the Trail of Tears, that they came up to the big house to get food and water before they were marched out on the reservations. There's especially a lot of information during the Civil War period. There are so much detail in these letters that you feel that you know the individual person. Uh, there are also many photographs of uh, the former Westington slaves, uh, many plantation records, and other documents. This, doc sorry. this document is an 1865 agreement for my great-great-grandfather. He agreed to work for the Washington family for $125 a year shortly after he was emancipated. Uh, this is his cornbread recipe, and I've had my mother's make it. It's very good. <laughs> This gentleman is Joseph Washington. He was born in Southampton County, Virginia, July 7, 1770. He first came to Robertson County, Tennessee in 1796 and visited the home of his cousin, Colonel Archer Cheatham. At that time, this lady was a small baby, small enough to be carried in the arms. He'd be on a bachelor, someone asked him when he was going to get married. And he said, well, I'll wait for this girl to grow up and I'll marry her, which is what he did in 1812 when she was 16 and he was 42, which her father was the wealthiest man in our county, so that probably helped. <laughs> this is the route that Mr. Washington and the slaves would have taken from Southampton County, Virginia to Robertson County, Tennessee, and this would have taken about three and a half months. And some of the descendants of the slaves said that they walked every step of the way. This is George A. Washington, and he was the only surviving son of uh, Joseph and Mary Washington, so he inherited the plantation uh, in its entirety. And this is his wife, Jane Smith Washington. This is a model. The Tennessee State Museum held an exhibit uh, called Slaves and Slaveholders of Westington Plantation, and they did a model for that exhibit. It sort of gives you an idea how some of the plantation uh, looked at that time. Uh, this is the main house, and then these are some of the slave cabins. Typically, slave cabins were put in neat little rows so the plantation owner could observe everything that the slaves were doing. However, uh, due to the laying around the plantation there being so hilly, the houses are more sporadic, so that they gave them somewhat more privacy than a typical plantation. Slave population, the source of slaves. Mr. Washington owned five slaves when he was in Virginia uh, in 1795. By 1813, they had increased to 33. By 1820, there were 44. 1830, there were 40. 1840, there was 109. 1850, 143. And in 1860, 274, making them the largest slaveholders in the state of Tennessee. Uh, Mr. Washington inherited 16 slaves from 1801 to 1828. Uh, he and his son purchased 125 slaves between 1801 and 1843, and there were 195 slaves born on the plantation from 1795 to 1860. Uh, and I know that because uh, there are many of these surviving documents which list the births of all the slaves on the plantation. This is an actual slave bill of sale dated 1802 for my great, great, great grandmother. She was the mother of Emanuel Washington. Uh, she was born on a plantation in Sussex County, Virginia, owned by Colonel Michael Love, who had a large plantation of about 50 slaves. He died in 1799, and 15 of them were inherited for, uh, by his son, Makaja Love. And in a couple of years, he became heavily indebted, and he sold my great, great, great grandmother at age 10, and her sister, Sarah, at age 12, to Joseph Washington, and he brought them to Robertson County, Tennessee, and our family has been there ever since, spanning uh, 12 generations through that line. I created this document, and this uh, records all the slaves that were purchased from 1801 to 1843. This is the first nuclear family that was purchased, Tom, Jenny, and their children, Frank, Hannah, Sarah, and Henny. Henny was my great, great, great grandmother, and she's the mother of a lady on the uh, original photograph that I showed you. Uh, in this case, uh, here, you have 14 slaves. And you could get a mortgage on slaves like you could any other property. So the Union Bank of Tennessee allowed the plantation owner money to purchase 14 slaves, and he was unable to uh, pay for them. So basically, the bank repossessed 14 people, and Mr. Washington bought all these slaves and uh, brought them back to the plantation in Robertson County. 
1843, George A. Washington married Margaret Adelaide Lewis and her father owned a plantation called Fairfield in Nashville. And he was a close friend to President Andrew Jackson. And as a wedding gift, he gave the Washingtons 29 slaves for $1. And there were seven families that were interrelated. Names of Washington slaves. Um, it's somewhat unusual, but up to 1858, slaves on Wissington Plantation were still giving their children African names, of, which indicates that there were African parents or grandparents, or otherwise they wouldn't have known these African names to give them. And from some of those names, we've been able to trace back what tribes they came from. Uh, most of the names are from the Bible, of course. There are many uh, classical names. Uh, most people name you for someone in the family, and that was to, especially with male slaves, because they have a tendency to be sold away more so, and so uh, you would name them to keep their connection to the family. Some people were given place names. America, Axum is a, a country in uh, Africa, Britain, Carolina Tom. There were already two Toms on the plantation when uh, this man was bought, so they called him Carolina because he was from North Carolina. There were several slaves named after the President, Harrison, Jackson, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and Washington. Several of the slaves named their children uh, after some of the white Washington family members if they had close connections to them. Uh, in 2003, I found the, the Wessington DNA Project where I uh, had DNA samples taken from various families in Robertson County and uh, traced what uh, ethnic backgrounds they came from. And the majority of them, of course, came from West Africa. And I think I've done about 27 or 18. Family and housing. The slaves were housed in single family units uh, with log flooring, with glass windows and shutters, big brick in chimneys. There was a loft for the children. Some of the cabins uh, measured 20 by 20 and some 20 by 36. And there were 40 of them that then uh, housed 274. 22 of the families on the plantation were headed by men, which was extremely rare for uh, the period right before the Civil War. Some families had three to five generations in them, which was also very rare. The Washingtons only sold two slaves from 1795 up to 1865. And those were for running away. And these are some of the cabins that were there at West. Some of these, uh, this photograph was taken in the 1890s, this is the early 1900s. And I took these two photographs in the 1970s. And this is a model of, of an interior slave cabin that was done for the, uh, the exhibit in Nashville last year. <coughs> Division of, of labor on the plantation. Uh, the men worked under a task system. The owner assigned so many acres of corn, tobacco, what have you to do. Of course, they knew how much work an average man could do in a day. They set these tasks that is going to take up your whole day for the most part. But some of the faster workers could accomplish these tasks earlier. So when they did that, they were allowed to raise their own tobacco crops. And Mr. Washington would keep up with how much they raised, and then when the tobacco was sold, he would give them part of the money. And also, they would tell him different items that they wanted from New Orleans when he sold the tobacco, and he had a, um, a record of that as well. Of course, this was to keep them attached to the plantation to uh, encourage them not to run away. Uh, most of them were engaged in tobacco production. They, uh, produced other crops that were blacksmiths, carpenters, stone masons. Uh, there was a large whiskey operation, all the surplus corn that did not go into feeding the slave family in the white Washingtons or the animals went into producing whiskey. They also processed pork there. There was a large pork operation where you could find uh, Washington hams on the menus of the finest restaurants as far south as New Orleans and as far north as Philadelphia. The women were not required to work outside at all if they had a child that was under two years old. If they had uh, any over two, there was a nursery on the plantation where women that were too old to work uh, cared for them. Primarily, the women worked in the gardens. They did sewing and weaving, domestic work, processed pork, did the milking care for children, the elderly, and the sick, and did cooking for their own families. This is a photograph uh, in Wessington uh, during the early 1900s white and black sharecroppers on Lexington. This is a lady preparing to do the wash. This is from uh, several hogs being killed on the plantation that they're processing the pork. Uh, this is a group of women there at Lexington, all of them are former slaves processing the pork. This is the smokehouse, and this building is still standing. Each week on uh, Saturday, the women would line up at the smokehouse, and 
they would be given so many pounds of meal, pork, sugar, flour, and so forth, depending on the number of individuals in their households. This is a tobacco field in Residence. In 1860, the slaves at Residence produced 250,000 pounds of dark fire tobacco, making them the largest producer in the United States and the second largest in the world. And at that time, Westington had 14,100 acres in one continuous farm. Uh, clothing was also made on the plantation and distributed uh, each year. Uh, women would get coats every other year, and the men would get them every year since the women did not work outside much. And this is where uh, the food was allocated to the slaves each week. So bacon meal, flour, sugar, vegetables, poultry, and uh, some of the slaves uh, hunted wild game. Like uh, DR rabbit, uh, raccoon, and all types of things. Uh, we do have proof that some of the slaves married uh, even before emancipation, although it was not legal. Uh, from a slave bill of sale, uh, 1814, that's the first proof that we have of a uh, slave being married. In this bill of sale, it states that Jenny is Tom's wife, and it includes their four children. Uh, in George A. Washington's diary in 1851, he recorded that Tom asked for Olive for his wife. And then after the Civil War, uh, Reuben Cheatham, who had served, Cheatham Washington, who had served in the United States Colored Troops, uh, his wife applied to get a pension after he had passed, and she stated in that pension that she was married uh, to him by Horace Carr, who was a black minister that carried <coughs> most of the slaves in uh, Robinson County and Port Royal communities. Uh, in the 1840s, and then they married again after they were free by the Freedmen's Bureau. Rebellion and punishment. Uh, we have documentation of slaves running away from the plantation, aiding others in running away, leaving without permission, fighting overseers, refusing to work, breaking tools, riding draft animals so they would be too tired to work, uh, work slowdowns, fighting one another, pretending to be sick. If uh, they broke into these rooms, they could be whipped. Confined, visitors not allowed on the plantation, nor them to go to other plantations to visit relatives and ultimately sell. And this is a list of Washington rebels. Uh, I've uh, listed each person uh, in any type of correspondence or other type of documentation that bucked the system, so to speak. I uh, listed the name of the person, their ages, uh, which part of the plantation they lived on, the date that it occurred. Uh, if this guy ran away, he reached Cadiz, Kentucky before he was uh, captured and brought back to the plantation. And these are um, other people who ran away from the plantation. The first case I have is documented as a slave named Jack. He's 18, 1838. $30 was offered for his recapture. Another slave was a slave named Lewis. He was hired out to an iron works in Kentucky. Uh, he met a blacksmith there, and this blacksmith persuaded him to run away, and their plan was to make it to Canada, and the blacksmith was going to uh, teach him his trade that they were to go to business as partners. And he was captured in Evansville, Indiana. The overseer from the plantation told Lewis that he wouldn't punish him if he would tell him why he ran away. And of course, after he got the information uh, out of him, uh, he did with him. Uh, David ran away four times, and he's one of two slaves that the Washington sold from the plantation, and after his fourth attempt, he nearly made it over the uh, Ohio River to freedom when he was captured and brought back to the plantation, and he was sold away from his five brothers. After the Civil War was over, he came back to Robinson County, got with his brothers, they moved to Cheatham County, and from there they moved to Nashville, and some of their direct descendants still live there. I was very fortunate when I started doing my research because there were 20 to 25 individuals who were children or grandchildren of Westington slaves. So I interviewed these people and got their stories. Uh, this is my maternal grandmother, Sally Washington, and she died when she was 85 years old. So far in my direct Washington line, no one has died under 80 since the 1700s. Uh, this is my grandmother's uh, brother, Bob Washington. This is his wife, Maggie Washington, who passed away when she was 99. And she died in 2003, and she was the last individual that was around from the beginning of my research. This lady was Maddie Terry. She and I attended the same church, and she died when she was 93. Her great-grandmother lived to be 104, so she shared many stories passed on by her great-grandmother. This is my cousin, Joseph Washington, and this photograph was taken on his 102nd birthday. And as a child, he lived next door to my great-great-grandfather, mother, and he had many stories to tell me. Many of you may have seen this lady on CNN. 
Uh, her name is Ann Dixon Cooper. She is the lady that President Obama mentioned voted for him when she was over 100 years old. And uh, one of the slaves that was born in Westington raised Mrs. Cooper. Mrs. Mandy Terry told me that her great grandmother, Sarah Cheatham, was born in Westington in 1810 and she did to be 104 years old. And she told her that when she was a small child, Westington sits high up on a hill in the back behind the big house. It slopes down, then the land flattens out, and there's a stream that runs through there. And she said her great grandmother told her that when she was a child, she and the other slave children went to the creek bed, collected clay, brought it up on the hill where Westington now stands, and the adults molded and made the bricks. And she always said, well, they knew what they were doing because the house is still standing. Ms. Terry said that her great grandmother could thread a needle with our glasses at 104 years old, and she could still chop her own fire with. Uh, this is my cousin Joseph Washington, and he died uh, a couple of weeks before he turned 107. And he told me when he was a child, he lived next door to my great great grandfather, Mother Emmanuel Henry Washington. And he said, uh, um, Everyone called my great great grandfather Uncle Man. And he said, Uncle Man could really sing. And he said, Can you sing? And I said, A little, little bit. And so he said that Uncle Man used to sing most of the songs in our prayer services, and he even sang some of the songs uh, for me. This is Mrs. Ann Dixon Cooper, and she told me that people as far as Japan had contacted her and came to see her after President Obama mentioned uh, her in his acceptance speech, and, and she said, they act like a, I didn't have a life before he mentioned my name. She said, I had a very interesting life. So she wrote a book called A Century and Some Change, My Life Before the President Called My Name. <laughs> During the outbreak of the Civil War, many of the slaves from Westington started emancipating themselves by running away. And so Mr. Washington came up with an idea that he would offer these men $10 per month if they would stay on the plantation and work. So they thought that was a good idea at first, and he listed all their names and the dates that uh, they agreed to work for them. So shortly thereafter, they thought, well, he's just trying to keep us on the plantation, so all 18 of them ran away. <laughs> uh, also, many of the former uh, slave men enlisted in the United States Colored Troop to fight for their freedom. And uh, when they were older men, they had to apply to get a pension. And so I have all their pension applications, and it's a genealogical gold mine. This guy, Frank, states that uh, he knows that when he enlisted in the Union Army, that he was only 12 years old. And he said he was grown as most grown men. At, at that time, he was very big. And he said uh, Union soldiers came to the plantation taking men off the place to work on the military fortifications, Fort Negley and Nashville and the railroads. He said, to say he's only 12, but they took him anyway, and he ran out of this. This is a group of Union troops in Nashville in 1864. And this is Fort Nigg, and some of the former African Americans from West Virginia uh, helped him ready. After emancipation, many of the former slaves went up north, some went west, some moved to Nashville. Some returned to Winston to work. This is my great great grandfather and mother with some of their children and grandchildren in the late. Uh, 1800s. Some people say, well, why did they come back to the same plantation that they were enslaved on? Several of the people from Westington worked for others as sharecroppers, and then the people didn't have money to pay them. So Mr. Washington, due to him making wise investments, he was even wealthier after the Civil War was over, even with the loss of all the slaves. So they knew at least that he was able to pay them for the work. And he was also paying out of Uh, this is the Antioch Baptist Church, and this was founded in 1869 by former slaves from Westington and, and others in the community. The first pastor of the church was Edmund White Washington, who was a former slave there. He and his wife served as teachers uh, there, which they made into a school as well. And later, one of the Fisk Jubilee singers was hired uh, as a teacher there. And the parents had to pay one dollar per month per child for their children's education, which was a great sacrifice. Uh, considering that they were only making 50 cents a day at that time. I also found that individuals as old as 40 and 50 years old were going to uh, school to learn how to read and write. They also met at the Antioch Baptist Church as soon as they were given voting rights to determine who they were going to vote for in the next election. And in uh, Washington correspondence, the, the mistress of the plantation wrote her son while he was in Georgetown attending college that every male on Westington that was a, a legal age would register to vote. So they had 100% voter registration here. This is a photograph of some of the former slaves uh, from the Antioch Baptist Church in the 1880s. 
This is the uh, daughter of a Westington slave of a school class in Cedar Hill, Tennessee in the early 1900s. Slavery was officially ended in February of 1865. However, African Americans in Robinson County passed on to their descendants. Not everyone was aware that they were free until August 8th. So that still held us a big celebration of our Emancipation Day in Robinson County. Nelson Washington was very instrumental in carrying on this tradition, and part of that started on his land, and some of that, uh, that celebration is still held on part of that land today. His brother, Urban Washington, was known for his special barbecue sauce for barbecue and whole hogs at that celebration, and his direct descendants still prepare the sauce and do the barbecue for that event. I think Allensville, Kentucky, and Port Royal also have big celebrations for the 8th of August. You women will like this story. Uh, slaves were married uh, before their emancipation, but they had no legal marriage. And what happened, oftentimes, uh, a male slave may be sold away. He could, have a, he could have a wife and kids, get sold away to somebody else, then marry, have kids, get sold again, marry, have kids. So when uh, the Civil War ended, these people were free. Sometimes we had a man and then several women coming up saying, well, you're my husband, I married you first and so forth. So some states passed laws that you had 30 to 90 days to make a decision which one of these wives were going to be your legal wife. Tennessee passed a law that if you remain living as husband and wife, that you would be with husband and wife. So this lady's name is Erie Fort Pitt, and she lived in Robinson County. And her husband, Alfred Pitt, was the wealthiest black landowner in our county. He even had blacks and whites sharecropping for him. So in their divorce petition in 1900, she stated that she had borne him 11 children. She helped him accumulate everything that he had. And so she had 50 witnesses, including half their children, signing this petition on, on her behalf. Her husband had 35 witnesses, including the other half of their children, saying what he said about her. He stated that she constantly nagged him. If uh, she so much as put a garden out, he'd have to have somebody else to finish it. So he, he felt that everything that he accumulated was on his own. So he said, well, you know, we married back when we were slaves, and we have not married again, so technically you're not my wife, and I don't have to give you anything. So she consulted her former owner, who was an attorney, and he found the 1866 law which stated that they were legally husband and wife. And the courts made him give her $1,000 in cash, 100 acres in land, and a horse, buggy, and so many pigs and chickens. I was raised with some of their great-grandchildren, and one of them said, well, John, if they had that much, why don't we have anything now? <laughs> and I said, well, your ancestor sided uh, with the mother, so he disinherited all the kids that sided with the mother. And then the one son she lived with, she gave everything she had to him. This is Rachel Washington Terry and Wiley Terry. They were both born slaves at Westington, and I got this photograph uh, of a portrait from their daughter, Lady Terry, who passed away a week before she turned 103 years old. Uh, Wiley Terry and two of his sons purchased 429 acres of land, which was once part of the plantation that they had been enslaved on, and some of this land is still in the possession of their direct descendants. And this is their son, Sally Terry, and his wife in front of their 19 Model T Ford, and they're the first African Americans in our county uh, that we can document to own a car. They also donated some of their land to start a school for African Americans. This is Wesley uh, Williams and Fanny Williams. And I got this photograph from their granddaughter, Carrie Washington, who passed away when she was 99. And they came to Westington and worked as sharecroppers after emancipation. Uh, many of uh, Fanny's direct descendants, such as her uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, said she was full blooded uh, Cherokee. So I had DNA tests done on one of her great-great-grandsons, and through her maternal line, she had African ancestry. And another uh, test I had done showed that one of her descendants had 18% Native American ancestry, which is extremely high for African Americans, which would have been about equal if she would have been half. And this is a white family of sharecroppers. After uh, blacks started leaving Robertson County, there was a 13% decrease in tobacco production. So the Washingtons hired uh, white farmers and other African Americans to work with the tobacco crops. And any of you that's worked in tobacco knows very dirty, backbreaking labor. And these little boys look like they're not thrilled about being out here. This is George A. Washington, and in 1892, when he passed away, he held over a million dollars in stocks and bonds, and that didn't, didn't include the wealth from the plantation. 
So uh, this is the layout of the plantation. He wanted his son Joseph E. Washington to have what was called the home place, and the rest of his children drew lots out of a hat to determine which part they would receive for their inheritance. And most of them built homes uh, and mansions on these properties. Uh, this is a photograph of the Washington family taken in Winston in 1891. This is the same day that my family's photograph was taken that I found in my seventh grade social studies textbook. This is the Westington mansion. Mr. Washington put a stipulation in his will that his children would not receive their full inheritance until they were 30. So his son, George A. Washington II, built this home. It was called Washington Hall. It was three-story, white brick with 44 rooms, and some of the crown heads of Europe had been entertained there. There was a ballroom on the upper floor that could accommodate uh, 250 guests. And uh, all of you, no doubt, have seen Gone with the Wind. I remember the staircase that Scarlett O'Hara falls down. It was made after the staircase in Washington Hall. Uh, Mr. Washington's daughter, Jane Washington Ewan, built this home called Glen Raven. And she and her brother stayed in a fierce competition with one another, having lavish parties, and they both went broke trying to outdo one another and they lost their inheritance. Uh, in 1993, I participated in an archaeological dig in Westington Plantation. And the actual spot we're digging in is where my great great grandfather and mother's uh, cabin used to be. And this is the cabin where uh, my cousin and I met. So while I was on the dig, one of the archaeologists said, John, uh, this lady is from White Washington from Lake Placid, New York, and he said, uh, she sent me this photograph of your great great grandfather and mother. And I had never seen it before, so I called her up and she said, you know, I've had this picture for about 50 years, and I wondered, does this family die out, move away, or whatever happened to them? And I said, no, we didn't die out, it's over a thousand of us. And she said, you know, when I was a girl, my father would talk about many of the slaves, and he knew exactly how they were related to one another because they had helped raise them. And she said that he took me all over the plantation and showed me where the slaves were buried. And she said, even as a child, I always felt that that wasn't right because they didn't have markers on their graves. And she said, I felt like our family should have done something about that. And she said, it's not uh, too late to do something about it. So she gave me funds to have uh, the names of individuals at that time that I knew to be buried there, erected. And uh, my great aunt that passed away when she was 99, at that time, she remembered going there as a child. The last person was buried in 1928. So she gave me a lot of the information, and I got other information from records. Another uh, descendant of the Washington family uh, gave me funds to have a fence put around it uh, about three years ago. The uh, burials there are oriented from east to west. They're buried in neat rows, and the graves were marked with field stones and wildflowers, and uh, most of the slaves were buried in wooden coffins. And they also sold wooden coffins to their neighbors as well. Now, uh, during the uh, slaves and slaveholder exhibit at the uh, Tennessee State Museum uh, this past year, many of the white Washingtons have never ever gotten together before, so they got together to tour the exhibit, and then they had uh, a family reunion. And they said, John, if it hadn't been for you, our family would have never ever got together, so we want to do something for your family. So uh, they're going to have a monument erected in the slave cemetery, not only the individuals that's buried there, but everyone who was ever on the plantation. And uh, right now I have 446 days. We hope to have it installed uh, by this fall and have a dedication. It's got dedicated to the 440 African Americans enslaved on Westington Plantation from its founding. 1796 until their emancipation in 1865, and then it uh, states uh, who the donors are. And uh, we have, we'll have their names set in uh, black African granite, and we'll note who's buried there by a cross and those that are following the Union Army by USCT. Our Washington family has held a Washington family reunion probably 70 years. So as part of our family reunion in 2000, uh, we toured with, and my great aunt at that time was 97 years old, and she had six generations of her family present. Uh, herself, her children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, great great grandchildren, great 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 grandchildren. I also have a cousin that lives in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and she has a five generation photograph uh, herself, her mother, her grandmother, great grandmother, and great great grandmother. She now herself has great great grandchildren, so she's actually seen nine generations of her family that she can remember. There's probably not many people in America that can say that they have known nine generations of their family. 
This is our Washington family tree, direct descendants from my great great grandfather, mother, Emmanuel Kenny Washington. And I think that spans eight generations. Since that time, I've done another one that goes back a little further. This spans 11 generations and it starts in 1760 and comes down to the present time. And this is just my family. And I've also done these for uh, several other families that came uh, from this. In 1983, the Washington family sold Wessington to Glenn and Donna Roberts. Up to its sale, it was the largest farm in America still held by descendants of the original owner. The slave cemetery is still there. There's a restored slave cabin. And then this is the White Washington family cemetery on the property. This is a book signing that I did in, um, in Nashville several years ago. And we have uh, several African-American families whose ancestors came from Wessington, uh, the Washington's Terry's and Scots and Greens, and then we have some of the white Washington descendants as well. And there are many other families that have family reunions, uh, that have connections to Wesleyan. This is the Gardner family. There are more African Americans in Robinson County carrying the Gardner surname than any other. Daniel Gardner, who was seated in the middle, and his wife had 18 children. This is the Green family. Uh, they're connected to the Odie family in Nashville. And they uh, were a very prominent family. This is the Cobbs family, a part of my mom's dad's family. And I started that family in 1999. And this was a photograph of a uh, white Washington family when they held a reunion in uh, June of last year. So this was the very first time that many of them had uh, ever met one another. These are faces of some of the individuals from Washington. This lady was Jane Washington, and she was known to be able to cure uh, various ailments uh, using herbs. So the, the, the slaves that opted not to go to the doctor unless they were too sick in the Washington was forced them to uh, went to Jane. This is Granville Washington. This was taken in Athens, Tennessee in 1892. This is his son, uh, Granville Washington, Jr. This is George Washington Nixon, and she's the lady that raised Mrs. Ann Nixon Cooper. This is Granville's son, Foster Washington who was the coachman there at Wessington. And there are many others. Uh, this lady, this is a portrait also painted by Maria Howard Wheaton, and this is the possession of some of the uh, white Washington descendants. This is Austin Terry, and his family was very prominent there as well. Uh, during the exhibit, the uh, Tennessee State Museum contacted some of the white Washington family members to get photographs and, and different items. And uh, one of them found this photograph in a the old photo album. So this is the oldest photograph of any slave in Wessington. Her name is Susan Washington. She was born in 1821, and she died when she was between uh, 95 and 100. This is Daniel Gardner. That was a portrait passed down uh, by his descendants. This is uh, Marion Sims Green. She was born <coughs> a slave in Wessington. Her father was the plantation overseer of Benjamin Sims. These are several others as well. This is Gabriel Washington, and he was the last Washington slave that remained on the plantation uh, after he was emancipated to carry the Washington surname. This was uh, Joseph Scott, and he also served in the United States Code of Troops <coughs> during the Civil War. And this is his brother, Daniel Scott, who was the most of the uh, From the Washington records, I've created a profile on every slave at Winston. The first one is Aaron Gardner on this. Uh, there are first name, their surname, um, what year they were born, where they were born, when they died, who they were purchased from, and when and where. And um, from other documents, I also listed who the parents were if known. Also, which some people are not aware, some of the slaves in Winston used other surnames even before they were emancipated, because uh, many of the uh, slaves are listed by uh, Cheatham, Lewis, Green, Terry on some of the other documents to distinguish them from other people of the same given name. So I've been able to document more than 200 years of my ancestry. Uh, here's myself. I was born in 1962. My mother was born, was born in 1928. She's now 86. My grandmother, Sally Washington, died when she was 85. My great grandfather, Amos Washington, died when he was 84. My great great grandfather, Emmanuel Washington, died when he was 83. 
and Godfrey Washington Sr. was born in 1787. His father, Godfrey Carr, was born uh, in Africa. So that's documented over 200 years from our late ancestors. For several years, I had uh, been telling people I was going to write a book. And so my mother got on me and she said, You've been saying you're going to write a book forever. You've got documents under your bed in the closet and drawers everywhere. And if something happens to you, all of that stuff is going to be down the drain. So I thought about what she said. So I worked for about three years bringing all this documentation uh, together. There was a lot of stuff I had to cut out. My editor from Simon Schuster to say, John, for the first time in my editing career, when I got all your work, I felt that I had bitten off more than I could choose. She said, you got enough documentation for 10 books. There's no way in the world it can fit in one. So uh, we whittled it down some. They didn't edit it quite as much as I thought. I thought when I sent it to them, they didn't come back and I wouldn't even recognize it. Uh, they were gracious on that, so uh, I'm very proud of that. But uh, the title of the book is The Washington of Wilson Plantation Stories of My Family's Journey to Freedom, which is not only my family's story, but it's the stories of everyone who was enslaved in Wilson and the white Washington family as well. That concludes my presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it, and at this time I'll answer any questions that anyone might have about my book or the research or Wilson or, or the exhibit, the uh, Tennessee State Museum. Uh, uh, traveling version of the exhibit will uh, be in Robertson County starting the first week in April and it will be there for four weeks and then it's going to tour the rest of the state in like for two years. Yes, Did you ever run into any opposition and you know talking to people? Were there any people who just didn't want to talk about it? No, I did not run into that. Uh, some of the people told stuff that they should have kept. <laughs> I, I didn't run into that problem. Is it in the book? <laughs> oh, some of it. I couldn't put, all, couldn't put all of it in. But I didn't run into A lot of people that try to trace their genealogy will say, you know, grandmother won't say anything about this or that, but I never ever had that problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have the books with you? No, I don't. Okay, what do you purchase? Uh, I have a website, wessington.com. Uh, you can go there and I can give you a card. And you can also get them from uh, Amazon and all things. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you can go ahead, sir. Do you want them to use the mic? No, thank you. Okay. Um, I was going to ask, there was a, a the, the, was it the Washington family? Well, oh, there's a family that you spoke of. I got here a little late. That was very prominent. And they were the first uh, black family to own a car. Oh, the Terry family. The Terry family. Um, were they allowed to be affluent at that time? Did they receive any kind of opposition? Like, well, how dare you have a car? How dare you, you know, have all this? No, they bought property from, from the former slave owner. And after, and their family stayed on the plantation for many, many years. Um, the family that I showed you, the original portrait, their great-grandson lived in the Wessington Mansion. Uh, years later, most of the Washington family members moved up north and, and northeast. And so uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Phyllis Terry stayed and lived in the Wessington Mansion until it was sold. And uh, him staying there all those years. Or before then, George A. Washington died in 1964, and he was in his 80s. And he was so disagreeable, only Mr. Terry could get along with him. So uh, after he needed care, Mr. Washington moved Mr. Terry, his wife, and two children in the big house with him. And then after he died, none of them wanted to come back, so they stayed there until the property was sold. And after it was sold, uh, for them staying there, they gave them 60 acres and, and built them a house. Yes. Were you able to find out what your ancestor that was born in Africa, his African name was? No, I have not been able to find that out. And my second question is, do you happen to know where the um, colored troops uh, signed on? Did they come to Clarksville to do it? Or? Some signed on in Clarksville. None of the ones from Wessington that I know of, most of them signed on in, in Gallatin. And uh, Mr. Washington had a receipt because they kept uh, documentation on everything. And he listed all their names and what dates uh, they were taking. Because quite a few signed on here in Clarksville mm -hmm. for the funds. Right. Jim came with the Gallatin instead. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know there are some that, that many of them signed up for the Union Army, but did anybody sign up for the Confederate Army? Because that did happen. No, it did not. With, in, with no one from Wilson. Yes. How does the institution of slavery, like I can't imagine what they did. I mean, I've read a lot of stuff. But, and, and, and the ones that portrayed the, some of the foundation of the judges, the blue muscle, 
But what I'm hearing here, it seems like Washington kind of took better care of their slaves than most. Well, it was a financial interest in, for them to, to, to take care of them or, or anyone, because it, it's basically an investment. I mean, they, because you know, they didn't sell them off and they, they, they didn't kind of split the families up to keep control of them. True, but that they had enough money where it was not necessary for them to, you know, to have to sell. So in most cases, when, say, if you, you own three slaves and you had 10 children, well, you couldn't divide those three slaves among those children, so you'd end up selling them and dividing the money, but the Washingtons were so wealthy that that was never an issue. And then when Joseph Washington died in 1848, he had only one child, so all everything that he owned just went to that one child. Now, had Joseph had 10 children, then those slaves would have been divided up among those children. Do you okay. know if, I'm sorry. Did you guys say, I'll ask you, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Do you know if any of the slaves who attempted to run away used the Underground Railroad, or were they pretty much on their own, or? As far as I, I've been able to tell, they were on their own. Now, one slave that uh, ran away, after he was captured, he told who fed him from another plantation, and Mr. Washington notes in his diary that he goes to this man's plantation and tells him that, your slave fed my slave when he, he ran away. And there was another instance where uh, the slave named Lewis was caught and it was told, the overseer whipped him and then he told that two other slaves on the plantation knew that he, he ran away. And the overseer told Mr. Washington, had this guy gotten away, he had no doubt that the other two that knew the route that he took, that they would have as well. And there was a, another situation where Davy, the one that ran away four times before he was sold, uh, the mistress of the plantation wrote her husband while he was away that during, and there was a very deep snow, and she said every, the, the uh, overseer and everyone else was out looking for this guy. And she said he was hid right under our noses in a barn, and the rest of them uh, fed him while he was here. And as many people that were on that plantation, not a single person told where he was, which was unusual. Now, uh, I've heard of some slave owners, if a slave ran away, and they thought, no doubt that some of the rest of them knew, like they would cut, well, you're not going to be able to eat any meat at all until somebody tells me, you know, where they are. And if that doesn't work, then I'll cut, you know, other food rations until somebody, you know, found it. So you are, also, if you didn't feel that you could take the risk yourself, you, you would still, you know, held accountable for somebody else running away. I assume Washington is a derivative of Washington? Yes, uh, the Washington's first ancestor was William D. Herdburn, and he lived in the 12th century. And for military service, one of the kings of England gave him an estate called Westington, and they became known as D. Westington. And when they came to America in 1656, they changed it to Washington. And that's what he was doing. Not through the Times. The, the Times ran an article and they had the first photograph 
and had them identify it. But I didn't do it. I was just wondering if they were archived. Some of the times uh, articles were archived, but uh, they're sporadic during the early 1900s. Okay. They're not consistent. Well, given the climate in Robinson County right now, I mean, you know, there, there's a situation going on. Yeah, I, find it, yes. I find it, oh, you know, sort of ironic that the uh, slaves at Westington Plantation were able to freely move about in Robinson County, it seems like. I mean, they were allowed What do you mean when they were enslaved? Well, yes, they were, they were allowed off the plantation, so I just wonder. No, when you say off, no. Uh, the Westington was 13,100 acres in one continuous oh, wow. farm. Because right. even the white, yeah, even the white kids, one of them uh, married a young in Kentucky, and she wrote about her life. And she said their nearest neighbor, Westington, so be the nearest neighbor, lived five miles away, and they produced everything you needed on Westington. Yeah. And she said they only left there twice a year. That was to get shoes and Christmas tips twice a year, so they didn't have to leave it for anything else. And the only time the Washington did own a 1,250-acre plantation in Todd County, Kentucky, and they would send slaves back and forth doing different things, bringing tobacco and taking food to the slaves that lived up there. But uh, generally, they wouldn't have gone off the plantation unless they were tending to visit with the Washington or for them. Yes. And how long did uh, former slaves continue to live and work for the Washingtons? Yeah. Uh, some of them, let's see. I'll say the last one <coughs> was probably a slave died in 1932. He moved to uh, Kentucky and then uh, later moved back to Mexico. And he was the father of the guy that was 102 when I, I met him. And then also, during the Depression, some of the former slaves had, had moved up north in, in Kentucky and then uh, to work in the coal mines. And then when the Depression came, home mines closed down. Some of them came back to Wissington and worked. And then after, you know, things got better, they left. Do you know if they consider it home? Well, it's the only place that some of them had ever known. Yeah. Some of, I mean, some people that were born there died there. My great-great-grandfather was born there and died there. And ended as well as my great-great-grandfather. He, he was the cook. The cook. It's in the book. I think. I'll do it. Okay. Yes. Do you know if um, Mr. Washington, the, the owner of the plantation or whatever, do you know, or him or his brothers or family, were there any biracial children? Mm -hmm. I didn't uh, focus on it. Okay, this is Granville Washington. He said to be the son of George A. Washington, and he, he's a dead ringer for Oh, wow. And the white family, when I first saw this picture, I asked my grandmother, I said, who's that white man? She said, he's not white, he's black. And so when I met some of the white Washington